Dungeons & Dragons as a franchise is one that has existed for nearly 20 years longer than I have been alive, and one that, for a good portion of that lifespan, has always eluded me. As someone who loves games and the video games they have since come to inhabit, especially now in hindsight, I find this to be as odd as it is almost impressive. Designed and created by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, the game was made to be essentially a storytelling creation tool and allowed for individual freedom instead of what is commonly referred to as military formation, where the player controls several units at once in varying factions or power levels. Despite the overwhelming popularity of the game and the IP throughout pop culture in general, I eluded it for many, many years for a multitude of reasons. I've been gaming basically as long as I can remember, and for so many of those years, I was pretty much exclusively a console gamer. PC gaming for a very long time felt like another world to me because really, in its own way, it was. I grew up in the 90s and gaming during that decade was filled with overpowered home computers and relatively limited video game consoles produced by companies that were designed for one thing and one thing only, playing video games. My parents had a PC growing up, and I would occasionally dip my toes into the world of computer gaming with the options that they had access to, but a majority of those experiences, for me at least, were partitioned to either being an early Star Wars game like Rebel Assault 2 or X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, and ranging to a seemingly excessively complex space sim like Free Space that my little six-year-old mind at the time couldn't find any enjoyment in because the sim-like elements of that game were just too slow-paced and too methodical for my younger self. If I wanted to play a game that involved spaceships in combat, I wanted those spaceships and that combat to be fast-paced, engaging, and filled with explosions that sent my little neurons in my brain on fire. The exception to this rule was that the PC library that my parents had also had a game called Myst. I've gone over Myst in my very first video on this channel, but Myst opened my eyes to the world of atmosphere and mood, something that console gaming at the time just couldn't really compete with at least not in the same capacity. Super Metroid was the moodiest game that my Super Nintendo at the time could muster, and despite that game being filled to the brim with mood so thick that you could nearly choke on it, it couldn't compare to the near photorealism of the pre-rendered superpowers that a game like Myst could conjure. And what this all means is that at the time, I was potentially an undiagnosed ADHD riddle child that needed immediate action, fast-paced gameplay, and a flurry of either platforms or guns going bang-bang for as long as possible to be truly engaged with a video game to completion. The only way that my 8-year-old self could even maintain the attention span of playing a game like GoldenEye with all of its intricately layered objectives and key cards was to play the game on the easiest difficulty, and even in that regard, I would often find myself blasting myself to the point where all of the alarms would be set off and I would be bombarded with so many enemies that even on that baby intended difficulty, I would be overwhelmed and shot to death. Meanwhile, the concept of board games and tabletop games in adjacency was always something that I was indeed aware of, but it either fell into the binary setting of something akin to Monopoly where you just roll dice and go around a square board and be equally as square and be equally as bored while playing it, or to the extent of something like Warhammer 40k where you had to get out a fucking tape measurer and sit there for 30 minutes calculating out a way for your automaton to hit the other person's automaton that is six inches away, only to find out that your personal automaton ran out of bullets two turns ago, and now your entire game is over because you had bet your entire strategy on this fucking thing killing the enemy. That was my understanding of tabletop and board gaming. At the time, I didn't want to partake in either of those two variables. What I'm trying to get at with all of this is that for years, what my impressions of what a fun game was, was something that was outwardly exciting, generically dumb fun, and anything that didn't fall into that category was very rapidly deemed boring and unfit for my attention. The feeling of adventure through game design needed to be immediate and inherently exciting on the frankly embarrassing surface level. But as the years went on and my taste for food went from McDonald's hamburgers to homemade Impossible Burgers, so did my taste in games expand slightly outward. Fallout 3 was not only the first open world game that I ever became enraptured in, but it was also the first flat out RPG game that I had ever experienced, and its blend of being a first person shooter helped 
eased me into an entirely new genre altogether. Its level up system was something that while in hindsight is so simple and not really reinforced enough to the point where most builds end up feeling somewhat homogenized, and its writing and dialogue system and options being so extremely basic that it feels as disconnected from the original games of the series that only a black and white filter can make the binary nature of that game nearly as resonant as literally collecting good guy or bad guy points. Despite all of that though, I still hold the game in a high regard not only for what it is, which is a meaningful examination of the nature of exploration and the enticement of discovery, but what it did for me as a lover of games in general. Immersive sims were a genre that I didn't know existed, and the only one that I had ever really played long before I ever tried Fallout 3 was the original Deus Ex. I played it for roughly 30 seconds before annoyingly shutting it off because I just had no idea that the game was built around player agency. Games that I had growing up obviously had player agency, I mean it's a default in gaming in general, but that world I was invested in at the time was so limited compared to what was actually out there. The more RPGs that I played, the more I realized what I loved about them. I love a lot of meaningful choices, a lot of dialogue options, and a lot of branching abilities and artificial progression. These are all generic statements that sound hollow, but there is a certain flavor and flair that is required for these bullet points to get filled with lead and make them whistle with an alluring melody like a bard's flute. Yet still, throughout these years of developing a taste for RPGs and finding joy in player choice and agency in them, I still had not played Dungeons & Dragons. At this point, it was out of sheer daunting intimidation. Many, many years ago, I would listen to the old YouTuber, the Spoony One, talk about his favorite sessions and the stories that played out in them over his years of playing the game, and I always found them riveting. But a game as massive and potentially as infinite as Dungeons & Dragons honestly confused me as to how it worked. How the leveling worked confused me, and the idea of needing so many sessions to complete just a single storyline was a lot for someone completely out of the loop to really understand. But his videos and stories were the first instances that I can remember of wanting to try to play the game. Flash forward to a few years ago and you'll finally see me around a table with a group of friends playing my very first few sessions of D&D. We were all finding our footing and doing our best to work our way through the intro to an apparently very difficult campaign, The Curse of Strahd, and our party is arguing over a commotion that's happening in the town square, while our DM slightly mentions that someone, a little low crow of a woman off in the distance, is looking rather suspicious. After a few minutes of the party getting nothing done, I turned to the DM and my character, a female tabaxi whose name was literally taken from my favorite character from Doki Doki Literature Club, takes out a dagger and after a skill check, throws it directly into this old crow's skull and lays her flat out in the middle of the town square. My party all freaks out, asking what the hell I was thinking, only for that woman to unfurl herself up back from the floor and snake away out of sight, implying something truly sinister around us. I tell you this because since then I have played several games of Dungeons & Dragons, but to this day, that is the highest high that I have ever had playing this game, because unfortunately I came to the realization that maybe the game of Dungeons & Dragons isn't for me. I've thought long and hard about the reasons behind it, but part of it, the other part we will come back to later, is the daunting nature of literal infinite possibilities that are present in any given moment of gameplay. The decisions that I like in an RPG are ones that I can choose from, and ones that I can think on and decide on for myself. Tabletop D&D is so expansive and so vast that suffering from paralysis of choice at any one of these critical moments, and honestly, even the non-critical ones, is so daunting to me as a player that I either have someone else make a decision for the party instead of me, or I just make a completely non-engaging decision unless led by a fantastic dungeon master. A good dungeon master is one that can work with your faults and your actions and help guide you into having the most fun and unearthing a part of you out into the open that allows you to express yourself in a way that is all at once your character that you're roleplaying and at the same time still truly and unequivocally you. And finding one of those is very difficult, and not unlike finding a quality therapist. 
But this intimidation of the vastness of choice is actually part of what made me consider giving Baldur's Gate 3 a go. As far as game design goes, I like a little limitation on my infinity. Standing at one end of a giant chasm and being asked, what do you want to do, is so much for my brain to handle compared to just being given the option of either skill checking a rope to throw across, trying to just jump it entirely, or asking all of my companions to coagulate and make a human bridge so I can walk across them to the other side. Part of me figured this fear of mine that plagued my sessions of real life D&D would be mitigated enough by having a preset amount of variables that still make me feel like I was using my noggin, but in reality, I was just being led along by a very invisible and unobtrusive rope. And in all honesty, this part of the game, from no matter what angle that I decide to look at it from, is excellent. From the obvious variety of choices and the implementation of class-specific dialogue options and the wealth of speech variety and actions that you have over the game and the potential of potentially thousands of threaded narratives that you can create. It's exactly what I want from an RPG of this nature. I want to have total control of the game and at the very least feel like my choices can drastically affect the game and the nature of its storytelling. Games like Mass Effect and Fallout New Vegas nail this feeling as well, but Baldur's Gate 3 eclipses all of them in its breadth of choices and its depth of storytelling. When I initially booted up Baldur's Gate 3 when it was new, I immediately was enjoying myself with this aspect of the game and how it practically begged me to lean into my character that I had made, the Paladin of Light, Miss Uba Eats. The limitation that Baldur's Gate 3 brought upon me by being a video game and not a real tabletop experience allowed me to navigate the storytelling and player agency aspects of D&D that always intimidated me in such a way that allowed me to play how I've always wanted to play D&D and let me feel out this character I had created and slowly but surely began to unearth her angles and her internal conflicts. For a few brief fleeting hours, I was truly enjoying myself. I was rolling poorly in some instances of the story, like I initially failed to release Shadowheart out of her prison at the very beginning of the game, and I was constantly failing sleight of hand tricks trying to open doors that could lead me potentially somewhere interesting. But none of that bothered me. Rolling terribly when you have a plan in mind around a problem can be somewhat frustrating, but I generally don't mind rolling poorly when it comes to narrative. It can create interesting situations and put the players in unique encounters, and it forces the DM and the players in tandem to think creatively and problem solve on the fly. It's basically narrative chess that makes two entirely different player groups playing the same exact campaign to be very quickly in entirely different situations that the other group will never see. As a lover of mechanics and game systems, I find that infinitely fascinating, and the fact that Baldur's Gate 3 can manage that while also still being a video game with all of the limitations that are brought onto the metaphorical table and off of the literal one that comes with that fact. But after a while, the issue that I've always had with Dungeons & Dragons started really reeling its ugly head in my face like a third nat one in a row. I think I hate combat in Dungeons & Dragons. In all of the attempts that I've had playing the game, whether it's Baldur's Gate 3 or actual tabletop Dungeons & Dragons, the combat system in this game is just not only the antithesis of fun for me, but I think that especially in a video game form, it goes against the entire reason from what groundwork I already enjoy the game to begin with. Going back to what I said earlier about rolling poorly in narrative real quick, it's an aspect that, yes, I am okay with, and for all the reasons that I stated. But is it something that I would change if I was all of a sudden in control of Dungeons & Dragons? Yes. It can be frustrating to have a game plan as simple as opening a lock and having that entire strategy fall apart because you got another bad dice roll Sometimes I just want to open the fucking lock. Sometimes I just want my mage to cast a healing spell. Sometimes I just want my paladin to pass a deception check. Failing a check in D&D can be fun, and it can be funny, and even potentially further or deepen the narrative. But a lot of the time, at least to me, 
it's disheartening, especially when it's something that happens frequently. And now you take all of that and you put it in the context of combat. And it brings up an interesting difference when you compare the tabletop version and the video game adaptation. Combat in both regards can bring a fail state. A fail state in a group game like D&D is, it's a little weird. That fail state is pretty difficult to obtain as there are pretty much only really two possible ways that the fail state can happen. Either you die or your party dies. In tabletop D&D, it's honestly a lot less punishing for a multitude of reasons. First of all, if only you die, there is a relatively easy way to mitigate that, and it's just make a new character. With a friendly DM, it's no big deal, really. You die, you create a new character, and you'll bring that character up to the party's level, and your DM will hopefully make a fun little reasoning for this random character showing up to this established party. If the entire party dies, then odds are you just have an asshole being your dungeon master, but even if that's not the case, then the story just ends. And then you all sit there and wonder what to do next. Start over? Just ignore the rules entirely and just say, oh, you didn't roll that one. Do you just go home? Do you just die? The real stipulation here, however, is the fact that a quality DM just won't really allow a party death, let alone a single player's death. They'll usually work around those instances to allow the players to constantly feel pressure from the campaign, but never to the extent of a full-on deletion of their importance or their player agency in the story being crafted at the table. But in general, with D&D combat, the issues that I have with dice rolls are brought up to their maximum potential of annoyance and frustration. The thing is though, I know that there is still a story being told through combat. But generally speaking in narrative, you can flub and fuck up and still make your way through that narrative. But in combat, you either win or you don't. So any potential bad die rolls only ever feel bad to me. You manage to take down three goblins and still have the leader left and the entire party is down on him other than a mage and the thief? Well, you better hope that you don't roll poorly. And really, that is the line that you walk whenever combat starts in Dungeons & Dragons. At least that's what it feels like to me. Sure, you can pick skills and build your character in a way that can higher the likelihood of success, but you're still leaving your chance of success to a literal die roll in the most mechanically critical moment of the game just not only rubs me the wrong way, it rubs me into a bed of nails with my eyes open. There is no enjoyment to be created out of a failed die roll. You have an entire spreadsheet of options at your disposal at any given second on your turn, and you can strategize the most optimal positioning possible, but at some point the game will just say no to you out of no fault of your own. Gaming is the only art form that can explicitly fail you for engaging with it in the incorrect manner. When you hit a fail state in most games, it is, generally, your fault for bringing that action to a false fruition. And now, finally getting to the problem with D&D being in a video game form, in a tabletop setting, the DM doing a good job at their job, they can flub the numbers. They can mitigate damage for the sake of enjoyment of the party and for the sake of the story. If you roll poorly over and over in a row, the DM can roll a safe roll and then just decide for your sake, oh, you got him. Which allows that player that has been consistently rolling poorly to have a moment of excitement and not feel like A, they're being useless to the party and B, actively not engaging with the game itself. But when you throw those systems of Dungeons and Dragons into a video game, that entire aspect is gone, and it is exclusively a game that is actively trying to kill you. There is no empathy involved with the DM in Baldur's Gate 3, and there is no consideration for how poorly it is that you're rolling. There is only strategy, and there is only the state of dead and not dead, and to me, that is never what a game of D&D should feel like. And I feel like I should mention here that yes, the karmic dice system is a thing that is in the game. But from people saying things that range from either I don't want it on in the first place, 
or flat out feeling that it just isn't working at all, I sort of think that it is safe to say that it leans towards not making much of an impact whatsoever. It might skew your roll ever so slightly in your favor, but it is only in the sense that instead of rolling five bad dice in a row, you're now only rolling four. Which I will never say isn't nothing. Woo! Oh, oh my god, I... Wow. But it's not much better. I get that in theory the Karmic Dice is supposed to supplement the nice DM that I was talking about in real life Dungeons and Dragons, but neither fix my core issue with the combat which is relying on ever so slightly mitigated fate. And on top of that, Baldur's Gate 3 combat, let alone D&D combat, is a vast system of spells, action, problem solving, and decision making. It honestly surprises me that the game succeeded as well as it did to what I can only assume being a vast amount of people that have never played Dungeons & Dragons before, let alone another Baldur's Gate game before Baldur's Gate 3. Especially solo. Playing Baldur's Gate 3 solo is an overwhelming experience as a beginner. Managing four different characters that are likely drastically different with all of their ability sheets at your disposal, while trying to also manage positioning, as well as setting up combos between you and your party all by yourself, even at the lowest difficulty setting, was way too much for me. It's a lot to learn and a lot to wrap your head around. And for clarity, I love micromanaging stuff in board games. I love looking at a character sheet and deducing what I want to do for my turn and all of that jazz. I live for that shit, dude. But my already standing issue with the combat coupled with these new problems put on top of everything while playing the game solo only made me dislike the game in the end. Roughly right at the beginning of the quest where you have to deal with the goblin camp that are threatening the tieflings and the druids, about three days into me playing the game, I just stopped playing. And I've never been more upset that I didn't like a game than I was with Baldur's Gate 3. Like, I was genuinely sad. Seeing all of these awards being thrown at it and the endless praise towards all of the things that I did like about the game and just being hardwalled by the combat left me feeling really bummed because I was missing out on something that I knew deep down was fantastic. Even with all of that in mind, I hoped one day that I would be able to go back and give the game a second chance and prayed that it would finally click with me that time so I can finally enjoy this game I wanted to love so terribly. Flash forward to about a month or two ago when I start work on this video and I ask my friend if they would be willing to join my old save and play with me so I can get a few hours of footage. They allowed me basically party leader privileges and said that they would let me just play the game as I normally would and make decisions for the whole party. At this point I had completely forgotten what the hell I was supposed to be doing and I wander into a room with some goblins throwing rocks at a bear. I go up to them and I start asking what they're doing. They asked me if I wanted to join in on this activity and I didn't really feel comfortable in participating in this cruel act towards this poor captive bear. And I also didn't want to instigate a brawl because I'm trying to talk to these goblin leaders at this camp and I'm trying to help the tieflings and the druids. So I ignore the problem, only for the bear to bash through the prison door and begin attacking us. So we join the goblins and attempt to stop the bear from attacking us because it's, a, you know, a fucking bear. We get the bear's HP down only for me to realize that it is literally Halson, the person that we were trying to look for apparently, that could help us with the parasites in our brain. My friend laughed because they knew what was going on. I went, oh, oh fuck. fuck. So we frantically try to salvage the situation and start attacking the goblins in the hope that it de-aggros Halson, but nothing works. So we decide to just go non-lethal after killing the goblins and knock Halson out. He goes unconscious, but our journal tells us that we have defeated Halson, and from every metric that we can look at, the game assumes that he is dead. So we're standing there, very confused as to what to do, because he's clearly not dead. Did I ruin the quest? Is Halson a salvageable life? So while we're sitting there trying to figure out what to do, I just loot Halson blind. I take every fucking thing on his person except his underwear. But then I had the little evil in my soul. Baldur's Gate 3 is a game that is famous 
for its player agency and the amount of storylines that it will continue for hours depending on what you do. And me being sort of a little shithead and loving to see how much I can push stuff like that. The second my friend takes off non-lethal attacks from our party, I take my big ass paladin hammer and bash the unconscious bastard in the head, killing him instantly. Now he's dead. Alright, let's go. <laughs> and this began the torrential madness that Uba Eats would begin to endure. The longer we played, the more my character began to form. I had Volo gouge my eye out, forcing him to leave the party. I attacked and stabbed Asterion when he tried to bite me in my sleep, critically failing the attack by the way, causing him to leave the party permanently. I attacked the zombified corpse of Morenia's husband, burning them both to death in the process. I sided with Lazelle when Shadowheart attacked her in the night, killing Shadowheart in a manner of seconds. Now, you may hear all of this and say, what the fuck? Why are you playing a chaotically evil character? You're a paladin. And I say, no! Uba Eats is a paladin, but she's a completely incompetent one. <laughs> she's trying to do the right thing, or at the very least, acts on impulse without thinking things through. She makes a bunch of terrible decisions that she thinks in her heart is the right one to make. Is that a good character? No, probably not. Is she chaotically evil? I mean, Probably. But I'm role-playing this character in a very specific angle, and I like the idea of a paladin that tries to do the right thing, but just sucks at it. But was I enjoying myself? That is the real question here. That's the whole point of this fucking video. Being able to have my options limited in dialogue and other specific choices in the parts that matter the most to me in an RPG like this coupled with the fact that the combat was mitigated between me and my friends that I was playing with, took off a significant burden of the importance of decision making for me. All of this paired with the natural camaraderie of friends fighting against evil and the ups and downs that come with that? The answer is yes, I was enjoying myself. I think that this circumstance really was the perfect storm for me to enjoy Baldur's Gate 3. Originally one friend, but becoming two friends that already had multiple characters and runs of Baldur's Gate 3 that were willing to hop into my game, let me fuck around to my heart's content, and take a significant portion of the combat off my shoulders. I got to pick all of the bonkers decisions just to see how much I could stretch the game's storytelling, and their presumably agape reactions upon me killing specific characters brought such a glee to my soul, and knowing that they didn't personally care about any of these off the ball choices because this was a run that was happening almost exclusively for this video, and they had no real commitment to anything that was happening. I had roughly four or five sessions with this mentality, but I hate to admit it, at a certain point, yet again, the issues that I have with combat just still came up and crept into my brain, tainting my overall enjoyment. People have told me, whether indirectly or directly, that if this is what bugs me about D&D combat, then I should just quick save after like every successful roll and just reload if I don't like the roll. First of all, that's not fucking fun and it's just tedious. Second of all, that's at that point not playing a game, that's just forcing yourself through a system that I don't even want to be there at that point in the first place. But then I started to ask myself a very serious question. And this is going to sound ridiculous after everything I've just said, but please listen to what I have to say because I love XCOM. <laughs> XCOM 2 is potentially a 10 out of 10 for me but it generally follows a very similar, if not exactly the same sort of combat structure as Baldur's Gate and Dungeons and Dragons. So why do I love XCOM and not Baldur's Gate? In a game like D&D, where the aspect that people really tend to gravitate towards, which is the role-playing aspect, at least that's what it always seemed like to me, the combat always seemed like a part of the game that was put there to make it more like a normal game rather than just a bunch of people sitting around in a dark room talking in weird voices. It brings excitement to generally every session of tabletop Dungeons & Dragons. The party starts a quest, finds a cave or something, solves a puzzle, and ends the session with a compelling combat encounter, and then with pizza. 
In XCOM, despite the fact that yes, the combat is structured very similar to D&D in the sense that you have to position yourself with a squad and tactically attack the enemies that rely on essentially die rolls and fate itself for you to win, I think what makes it different for me is roughly two things. One, there is no disconnect happening between the systems in XCOM. All aspects of the entire game, from base building to research and recruitment, are all structured around the central mechanic of the game, which is combat, and improving your squad to better your chances in combat. D&D has two different games happening within it, the role-playing aspect and then the combat. Josh Sawyer, the game designer of Pentiment and Fallout New Vegas, has a really interesting video where he talks about his issues with some of these problems. And he put it best when he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that you don't necessarily want to role play a character when it comes to your stats. Because you want to min-max your character for the combat sessions, regardless of what your character is or what their beliefs are. There is a disconnect mentally and there is a disconnect mechanically. The second thing is that even though you always have a wide variety of characters to choose from in XCOM, you only ever have four on the field. And despite the fact that with practically necessary DLC from XCOM 2, which adds unique characters with wholly different abilities and special attacks and unique weapons, generally speaking, and I mean like roughly 90% of the time, you're going to be using characters that have a maximum of like six options, no matter what. You can move, you can overwatch, you can defend, you can shoot, you have the option of a class specific ability or two, and then an item that you've given them. This may not sound like enough of a difference to matter, but if you've seen my video on Bellatro, the indie breakout hit of the year, then you'll know that I like complex decision making, but in a filter of clarity and simplicity. Bellatro Under the Hood is really an incredibly complex game when it comes to its nuances and its overlapping mechanics, but there is a clean sheen of readability and limited options that the game gives you. That makes the entire systems of fate determining combat feel less overwhelming and much more my fault. After doing all of this thought experimentation and determining my feelings towards Dungeons and Dragons as well as Baldur's Gate 3, I do unfortunately find myself in roughly the same spot as I was when I started making this video. I do however have a much greater appreciation for everything that the game is doing as well as a better understanding as to what my favorite things about the game are in general and a better grip on what makes this game as popular as it is. It makes me wish that there was a way to play this game without the combat mechanics at all because all I want to do is engage with the characters, the plot twists, the interactions that I have on the game's narrative, and its seemingly endless impact that I can have on its world. But that's not the end of the story. Not yet, anyway. Because I own a little game called Blood on the Clock Tower. For those not aware of what that game is, in short, it is a social deduction game where you have a group of people with randomly distributed characters, each with their own special powers, and at least one of those players in each game is evil, with their own suite of abilities and impact on the game. The good players have to figure out who the evil character is and kill them before the evil player wipes out the entire town that the game takes place in. Pretty simple, right? Well, yes and no. Big no, actually. Because unlike most social deduction games like Mafia or even Werewolf, there is essentially a dungeon master in the game that controls what characters are in the game as well as what information the players in the game get access to and in some instances the storyteller, as the game calls the dungeon master, can outright lie in order to keep the game as tense as possible. The goal of the storyteller isn't to get the good players to win, nor is it to get the evil players to win as that would be a completely one-sided game and not fun in any regard. The goal of the storyteller is to make the game stretch out as long as possible, heightening the tension after every single round of the game. As the storyteller, you want the game to go until the last possible round so that whoever wins is dictated by not only the best players, but the ones that can work together to confront evil or the ones that can trick themselves into victory. And I have played many, many games of Blood on the Clock Tower, but I have only ever played the game 
as its storyteller. It's a skill that I had honed for a while, and after many of these gaming sessions, I was able to get the game to last until those faint final rounds with just a couple people left, and the wrong decision at the end of those rounds would grant total victory or absolute defeat. As the storyteller, there is no sense of a fail state for you, as no matter who loses, you, in a sense, win. Now, is that a bit greedy of me as a game player? Yeah, I guess so. But I have thought about that, and I had this feeling that I would indeed enjoy being a dungeon master rather than a participant in D&D. As a DM, there is no fail state for you to fall into. There is no immediate need to strategize in the best way possible, only to have a failed dice roll screw up your entire game plan. There is no sense of annoyance when a die roll falls against your favor because it is only ever in the favor of the players, the one that you are trying to get to engage with you. Honestly, being a dungeon master, at least at the time that I am writing this, seems like my last real shot to finally engage with this game that people love so much and find my own sense of joy out of it. So unfortunately, my never ending quest to love Baldur's Gate 3 continues. But hey, if this is the path I'm taking, I guess there's always Disco Elysium. Tomato is a fruit, but it's also a vegetable. That looks kind of cool. It really, it really bugs me that this isn't Times New Roman. Really funny that that's bothering you. How does it not bother you? Bothering? What, what, what else would it be in? Pen, penmanship, fake faux penmanship.